This is a multi-part series of videos that will break down what truly happened on 911. Forget everything you've heard before about this event. We will now provide you with undeniable facts and things that happened before, during, and after the tragic event. Once you've heard all the facts, you truly won't be able to look at this event the same way again, and this will widen your perspective and shed more light on what's taking place in Palestine and Gaza right now. This is just part one of the series. The following parts of this series will be available in the comments or the description as they come out. Wake up, Americans. You're about to be pulled into a war with Arabs, with the Muslim world. And you're going to be made to believe that something horrible that happened to you was done by the Muslims. But it wasn't done by the Muslims. It was done by a wild card, the Israeli Mossad, that's cunning and ruthless and can carry out attacks on Americans and make it look like Arabs did it. That's the literal definition of a false flag. They didn't write that. That's a false flag. That's not my conspiracy theory. That's a U.S. Army report. The day before, published the day before 9-11. Yes. You can call me any name you want to call me. That's a U.S. Army report. They warned us. They were telling us what Israel is capable of doing. We'll prove to you how 911 was actually about Palestine. Yes, believe it or not, it was about Palestine and the Middle East as a whole. Way back then, this was an operation done by the Israeli Mossad to justify and help the West see the Arabs and Palestinians as villains and evil, to justify the war on Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Middle East as a whole. These are the newspaper cutouts and the actual reports of what the man just said in the previous video. Pay attention to the date on the newspaper and what's being said in the newspaper. These are papers that were published the previous date before the 911 event. It clearly states that there were reports within the United States that the Israeli Mossad was about to make a big move, or a wild card as they called it. And whatever that event would be, it would be blamed on the Palestinians and Arabs, making them out to be terrorists and justifying this war on terror against the Middle East. Surely we need more proof than this, right? There comes the famous dancing Israelis. If you haven't heard of them, here you go. Watch how there are hundreds of reports on how the CIA and FBI knew Israel had an involvement in the attack. In fact, Israel even sent people to go and record it. No, seriously, they actually did. They were so proud of their attack on the U.S. that they went and recorded it. And Benjamin Netanyahu even said this would be good for Israel. We are benefiting from one thing, and that is the attack on the Twin Towers and Pentagon and the American struggle in Iraq, Ma'ariv quoted the former prime minister as saying. He reportedly added that these events swung American public opinion in our favor. Now it's time to take a look at those FBI reports on the so-called dancing Israelis. It was widely reported that men had been celebrating the attack after recording the first plane strike. They were not Al-Qaeda, but they were detained. The men who were detained due to the report they were taping the first plane crash and then celebrating and joking about it, actually went on television and admitted it was their job to record the attack. I grabbed my binoculars and I could see the towers from my window. And this is where I, you know, I'm looking. And all of a sudden, down there, I see this van park. And I see three guys on top of the van. And I could see that they were like happy. You know, they, 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 were, they didn't look shocked to me. You know, they didn't look shocked. There was a group of Israelis, uh, some of whom later were revealed as Mossad assets, who were arrested after cheering and high-fiving and videotaping uh, the crash of the airplanes into the World Trade Towers. Several other men were detained after a van full of explosives was stopped outside of Manhattan. 
Earlier, we had heard that an FBI spokesperson said that there was a report on the George Washington Bridge, which is another facility which you folks are responsible for policing, uh, a report that there had been a van uh, stopped there that had explosives. Asked this week about another sprawling investigation and the detention of 60 Israelis since September 11th, the Bush administration treated the questions like hot potatoes. I would just refer you to Department of Justice with it. I'm not familiar with the report. I'm aware that uh, some Israeli citizens have been detained. With respect to why they are being retain detained and the other aspects of, of your question, whether it's because they are in intelligence services or what they were doing, I will uh, defer to the Department of Justice and the FBI to answer that. On March 6, 2002, a draft report from the DEA said it may well be an organized intelligence gathering activity. Despite all of this, all the Israelis were let go without any espionage charges being filed. Fox News anchors Brit Hume and Carl Cameron would do a four-part investigation into these allegations in December of 2001 and yield stunning results. It has been more than 16 years since a civilian working for the Navy was charged with passing secrets to Israel. Jonathan Pollard pled guilty to conspiracy to commit espionage and is serving a life sentence. At first, Israeli leaders claimed Pollard was part of a rogue operation, but later took responsibility for his work. Now Fox News has learned some U.S. investigators believe that there are Israelis again very much engaged in spying in and on the U.S. Since September 11th, more than 60 Israelis have been arrested or detained, either under the new Patriot anti-terrorism law or for immigration violations. A handful of active Israeli military were among those detained, according to investigators, who say some of the detainees also failed polygraph questions when asked about alleged surveillance activities against and in the United States. Investigators suspect that the Israelis may have gathered intelligence about the attacks in advance and not shared it. A highly placed investigator said there are, quote, tie-ins. But when asked for details, he flatly refused to describe them, saying, quote, evidence linking these Israelis to 911 is classified. I cannot tell you about evidence that has been gathered. It's classified information. Now, when the FBI investigated, uh, it quickly unraveled to be the largest foreign spy ring ever uncovered inside the United States, the largest, even the Soviet Union had not been spying on the United States as much as Israel has been doing. So they, the FBI started to round up these spies, they started to arrest them very quietly, and they were about halfway through this process of rounding up this spy ring when 9-11 happened. Numerous classified documents obtained by Fox News indicate that even prior to September 11th, as many as 140 other Israelis had been detained or arrested in a secretive and sprawling investigation into suspected espionage by Israelis in the United States. Investigators from numerous government agencies are part of a working group that's been compiling evidence since the mid-90s. These documents detail hundreds of incidents in cities and towns across the country that investigators say, quote, may well be an organized intelligence gathering activity. The first part of the investigation focuses on Israelis who say they are art students from the University of Jerusalem and Bazalel Academy. Documents say they, quote, targeted and penetrated military bases, the DEA, FBI, and dozens of other government facilities, and even secret offices and unlisted private homes of law enforcement and intelligence personnel. The majority of those questioned, quote, stated they served in military intelligence, electronic surveillance intercept, and or explosive ordnance units. Why would Israelis spy in and on the U.S.? A General Accounting Office investigation referred to Israel as Country A and said, quote, according to a U.S. intelligence agency, the government of Country A conducts the most aggressive espionage operation against the U.S. of any U.S. ally. The document concludes, quote, Israel possesses the resources and technical capability to achieve its collection objectives. What about this question of advanced knowledge of what was going to happen on 9-11? How clear are investigators that some Israeli agents may have known something? Well, it's very explosive information, obviously, and there's a great deal of evidence that they say they have collected. None of it necessarily conclusive. It's more when they put it all together. A bigger question, they say, is how could they not have known? Almost a direct quote, Brett. It is now apparent that this intelligence ring was inside the U.S., had prior knowledge of 9-11, and had a classified role in 9-11, which officials refused to discuss. It was also able to penetrate U.S. intelligence agencies and secret offices, 
yet all were released. The men who were detained due to the report they were taping the first plane crash and then celebrating and joking about it actually went on television and admitted it was their job to record the attack. And at that point we were taken for another round of questioning, this time related to our allegedly being members of Mossad. The fact of the matter is we are coming from a country that experiences terror daily. Our purpose was to document the event. How could they have known about the attack? And who sent them to document it? The evidence points to a large intelligence network inside the United States that had teams on the ground, such as the ones recording the attack, and electronic surveillance teams gathering information. Some evil is just, it can't be explained. Are, the, are these people happy? Are they, are they joyous no. now? Are they celebrating? Oh, absolutely. Oh, they're celebrating. God. There's one report. I, this has not been confirmed, but there's several reports that there was a, a, a cell, one of these cells, across the Hudson River. And they got on the, this is the report. I emphasize, I don't know this for a fact, but there's several witnesses who say this happened. They got on the roof of the building to look across. They knew what was going to happen. Yeah. They were waiting for it to happen, and when it happened, they celebrated. They, they jumped for joy. In the days after 9-11, while Ground Zero continued to smolder, millions heard Dan Rather and various media outlets repeat vague and unconfirmed reports of arrests that took place that day. These rumors held that Middle Eastern men, presumably Arabs, were arrested in explosive-packed vans in various places around the city on September 11th, and that some had even been photographing and celebrating those events. What most do not realize is that those reports were not mere rumors, and we now have thousands of pages of FBI, CIA, and DOJ reports documenting those arrests. The men were spotted shortly after 8.46 a.m., yet somehow at this early stage, just minutes after the first plane strike on the World Trade Center, they were already positioned in a parking lot in Liberty State Park, taking pictures of the towers and celebrating. They left the scene shortly after being spotted, and at 3.31 p.m., the FBI issued an all-points bulletin advising officers in the greater New York area to be on the lookout for a white 2000 Chevrolet van with urban moving system sign on back. The FBI has now put out a nationwide APB all-points bulletin for a white Chevy van with New Jersey registration. Written on the back is Urban Moving Systems. Apparently there are three male occupants. Let's repeat that. The FBI has now put out an APB, an all-points bulletin, nationwide. They're looking for a white Chevy van with New Jersey registration. And written on the back of the white van are the words Urban Moving System. Apparently this van is carrying three male occupants. Obviously, if you see this van, you're asked to contact the FBI immediately. At 3.56 p.m., the van was spotted traveling eastward on State Route 3 in New Jersey and pulled over by Officer Scott DiCarlo and Sergeant Dennis Ravelli of the East Rutherford Police Department. Inside, they found five men. Sivan Kurzberg and his brother Paul, Yaron Schmel, Oded Elner, and Omar Marmari. A major terrorist manhunt began. And just six hours after the attack, the van was stopped at a roadblock by patrolman Scott DiCarlo. We were asked to detain the van and the passengers. They were just removed from the vehicle, patted down for safety precaution, and, uh, you know, detained. 911 call at 410 Park. I think once the uh, FBI arrived, one of them stated that they were on our side. So there's something to that effect. According to the police report of the incident, Sivan Kurzberg told Officer DiCarlo, We are Israeli. We are not your problem. Your problems are our problems. The Palestinians are the problem. Their official story, they were just Israeli tourists working for a moving company who had heard about the first World Trade Center strike and rushed to get a better view of the events. They told interrogators they were working for Urban Moving, a shipping and storage firm run by an Israeli businessman who often employed Israeli students without work permits. The men say there was an innocent explanation for what was found in the van and their behavior on 
They were, they say, simply on a working holiday. We heard in the news that one of the plane was uh, crashing down the building and we thought it was an accident at the beginning. So we went up to the roof of Oba moving and we saw the building burning. There is a better view from a building in Jersey that is up a hill, a straight line to the World Trade Center. We decided to go up there. It's like two, three minutes from the office. Stand over there and take some pictures. Everyone wants a picture like this in his camera. Although this narrative is still trotted out when the story of the dancing Israelis is raised in the media, it is an easily demonstrable lie. FBI reports confirmed that the men were not taking somber pictures of a horrific event. When their 76 pictures were developed, they revealed the men had indeed been celebrating, smiling, hugging each other, and high-fiving. One of the pictures even featured Sivan Kurzberg holding a lighter up with the burning tower in the background. And these were no ordinary tourists. Oded Elner had $4,700 stuffed into his sock. They lied to the police about where they had been that morning. They were carrying plane tickets for immediate departure to different places around the globe. The FBI confirmed that two of the men had ties to Israeli intelligence and came to suspect that they had indeed been on a mission for the Mossad. And of course, after returning to Israel, Elner claimed on national Israeli TV that they had been sent there to document the event. And at that point, we were taken for another round of questioning, this time related to our allegedly being members of Mossad. The fact of the matter is, we are coming from a country that experiences terror daily. Our purpose was to document the event. Their purpose was to document the event? But how could they possibly have known what event they were documenting at that point? before the second plane strike, when those few who even knew about the situation had assumed it to be an accident or pilot error. And when did they arrive at the parking lot to document the event anyway? The FBI reports show how the men gave confused and often conflicting accounts of when and how they learned about what was happening and when they arrived at the parking lot. Oded Elner even said they had arrived there shortly after 8 a.m., which would have been 45 minutes before the attacks even began. This is in line with one of the eyewitnesses that had placed their urban moving systems van at the parking lot at 8 a.m. How could they have been in place and ready to document the event unless they knew what was about to happen? Any way you cut it, this story is unbelievable. Men with documented connections to Israeli intelligence and working in the United States without appropriate permits were detained after having been caught celebrating the attack on the World Trade Center at a time when no one knew that the WTC strike was an attack. So surely these men are locked behind bars to this day, right? Surely they were transferred to Guantanamo and held without trial for 15 years as part of the war on terror, weren't they? No. They were immediately transferred to federal custody, held for 71 days, and then deported back to Israel. The owner of the Urban Moving Systems Company that had employed them, Dominic Souter, was investigated by the FBI too. They concluded that urban moving may have been providing cover for an Israeli intelligence operation, and even seized records and computer systems from the company's offices. When they went back to question him again on September 14th, he had fled back to Israel. And what about the dancing Israelis' pictures themselves? The Justice Department destroyed their copies on January 27, 2014. And these intelligence agents on an intelligence mission who were there to document the event of 9-11 before anyone knew 9-11 was taking place? Don't worry, they were just spying on Arab terrorists. And while the FBI or certain sources might believe that in fact they were Israeli intelligence, they don't believe that the U.S. was a target, that they were actually investigating Muslim groups? They believe if this was an intelligence operation by Israel, that it was focused on the Islamic groups uh, and charities that raise money for groups that are considered by uh, U.S. law enforcement and others terrorist groups. And you'll note that after September 11th, the U.S. moved on many of these groups with indictments, arrests, raids on their headquarters, something that hadn't happened prior to this. These are groups that Israel believes have been funding Hamas and other terrorist organizations? Groups that are responsible for most of the suicide bombings there. But this story is not merely preposterous on its face. Even the implications of this story are themselves preposterous. If indeed the official story is a ridiculous lie, 
then are we to believe that these crack Israeli Mossad operatives, who were presumably aware of the attack that was about to take place, had been sent to photograph the burning tower from a parking lot across the Hudson River? And that these specially trained intelligence professionals on their super secret mission were celebrating, high-fiving, and going out of their way to be noticed in performance of their task? This is equally preposterous. The only other possible conclusion is that these men were serving merely as a distraction, that they were not there to photograph for Israeli intelligence one of the most heavily photographed scenes in the world on that morning, but instead to be noticed and arrested as a way to divert attention from a much bigger and more sinister story. So if they were meant to distract from a bigger story, what story could that possibly be? It has been more than 16 years since a civilian working for the Navy was charged with passing secrets to Israel. Jonathan Pollard pled guilty to conspiracy to commit espionage and is serving a life sentence. At first, Israeli leaders claimed Pollard was part of a rogue operation, but later took responsibility for his work. Now Fox News has learned some U.S. investigators believe that there are Israelis again very much engaged in spying in and on the U.S., who may have known things they didn't tell us before September 11th. Fox News correspondent Carl Cameron has details in the first of a four-part series. Since September 11th, more than 60 Israelis have been arrested or detained, either under the new Patriot anti-terrorism law or for immigration violations. A handful of active Israeli military were among those detained, according to investigators, who say some of the detainees also failed polygraph questions when asked about alleged surveillance activities against and in the United States. There is no indication that the Israelis were involved in the 9-11 attacks, but investigators suspect that the Israelis may have gathered intelligence about the attacks in advance and not shared it. A highly placed investigator said there are, quote, tie-ins, but when asked for details, he flatly refused to describe them, saying, quote, evidence linking these Israelis to 911 is classified. I cannot tell you about evidence that has been gathered. It's classified information. Asked this week about another sprawling investigation and the detention of 60 Israelis since September 11th, the Bush administration treated the questions like hot potatoes. I would just refer you to Department of Justice with it. I'm not familiar with the report. I'm aware that uh, some Israeli citizens have been detained. With respect to why they are being retain detained and the other aspects of, of your question, whether it's because they are in intelligence services or what they were doing, I will uh, defer to the Department of Justice and the FBI to answer that. Beyond the 60 apprehended or detained and many deported since September 11th, another group of 140 Israeli individuals have been arrested and detained in this year in what government documents describe as, quote, an organized intelligence gathering operation designed to, quote, penetrate government facilities. Most of those individuals said they had served in the Israeli military, which is compulsory there, but they also had, most of them, intelligence expertise and either worked for Amdocs or other companies in Israel that specialize in wiretapping. Earlier this week, the Israeli embassy here in Washington denied any spying against or in the United States. Carl, what about this question of advanced knowledge of what was going to happen on 9-11? How clear are investigators that some Israeli agents may have known something? Well, it's very explosive information, obviously, and there's a great deal of evidence that they say they have collected, none of it necessarily conclusive. It's more when they put it all together. A bigger question, they say, is how could they not have known? Almost a direct quote, Brett. The most phenomenal part of this report is not that it was eventually erased from the web by Fox News itself, but that it ever made it to the air at all. In December of 2001, Fox News investigative reporter Carl Cameron filed an explosive four-part series that went in-depth into an Israeli art student spying ring that had been under investigation before 9-11, extensive Israeli wiretapping of sensitive U.S. government communications, and the 60 Israeli spies that were detained in the wake of the September 11th attacks. Unsurprisingly, the story was quickly dropped, and no mainstream journalists dared to continue probing into the matter. This is the real story of Israeli spies in 9-11. Not some vague rumors about some dancing Israelis, but an FBI dragnet that swept up the largest foreign spying ring ever caught red-handed on American soil. And although the FBI were convinced that these spies knew about 9-11 in advance, their investigations were stifled and the issue was swept under the rug. Rather than making Israel enemy number one in the war on terror, Israel remains to this day the U.S.'s most important ally. 
And if I'm fortunate enough to be elected president, the United States will reaffirm we have a strong and enduring national interest in Israel's security. In 2001, weeks after the attacks on New York City and on Washington, and frankly, the attacks on all of us, attacks that perpetrated, and they were perpetrated, by the Islamic fundamentalists, Mayor Rudy Giuliani visited Israel to show solidarity with terror victims. I sent my plane because I backed the mission for Israel 100%. But perhaps this is understandable. After all, we all remember how Yasser Arafat gloated about 9-11 and said it was good for Palestinians, right? Oh wait, that wasn't Yasser Arafat. It was Benjamin Netanyahu. The Israeli newspaper Ma'ariv has reported Israel's former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has publicly said the September 11th attacks have been good for Israel. Netanyahu said, quote, we're benefiting from one thing, and that is the attack on the Twin Towers and Pentagon and the American struggle in Iraq. My name is Donald Trump, and I'm a big fan of Israel. And frankly, a strong prime minister is a strong Israel. And you truly have a great prime minister. In Benjamin Netanyahu, there's nobody like him. He's a winner. He's highly respected. He's highly thought of by all. And people really do have great, great respect for what's happened in Israel. So vote for Benjamin. Terrific guy. Terrific leader. Great for Israel. Given that the ultimate consequence of 9-11 was the beginning of a now 15-year-long struggle to transform the Middle East, a struggle that the neocons that went on to populate the Bush administration had been openly advocating since the clean break policy paper in the mid-1990s, it isn't hard to see how the September 11th attacks were indeed a boon for Israel. But information linking Israeli spies to advance knowledge of 9-11 remains classified information. In a world of true justice, the dancing Israelis and other Israeli spies with insider advanced knowledge of the 9-11 attacks who openly celebrated those attacks, would be the targets of the war on terror, not its beneficiaries. Some evil is just, it can't be explained. Are, the, are these people happy? Are they, are they joyous no. now? Are they celebrating? Oh, absolutely. Thank they're celebrating. God. There's one report. I, this has not been confirmed, but there's... Now what comes next is by far the most insane, ridiculous pieces of evidences I've ever seen. To think that this happened and no one has questioned it since. On September 11, 2001, the BBC reported that the Salomon Brothers building, WTC7, collapsed before it actually collapsed. Hard to explain, and most people aren't even aware that the building collapsed much less that it was reported to have happened before it had happened. New York had been hit by airplanes. In Washington, there is, there is a large fire at the Pentagon. The Pentagon has been evacuated. And there, as you can see, perhaps the second tower, the front tower, the top portion of which is collapsing. Because everybody, once you have seen Building 7, there is no way back. You can, you can cheat on yourself, and you can try to suppress it, no but, but you cannot. You, you have seen it, and then there is no way back. It's, very, it's not very healthy, you know, to lie to yourself. I say, no, I didn't see that. Yeah. But some, many people do, because it's simply too painful. Now, more on the latest building collapse in New York. You might have heard a few moments ago, I was talking about the Salomon Brothers building collapsing. And indeed it has. It seems that this was not a result of a new attack. It was because the uh, building had been weakened uh, during uh, this morning's attacks. We'll probably find out more now about that from our correspondent, Jane Stanley. Jane, what more can you tell us about the Salomon Brothers building and its collapse? Well, only really what you already know. Details are very, very sketchy. As you can see behind me, the uh, Trade Center appears to be still burning. We see these huge clouds of smoke and ash, and we know that behind that there's an empty piece of what was a very familiar New York skyline, a symbol of the financial prosperity of this city, but uh, completely disappeared now, and New York is still unable to take on board what has happened 
to them today. Presumably there were very few people in the Salomon building when it collapsed. I mean, th there were, I suppose, fears of possible further collapses around the area. That's what you would hope, because they don't really know where to turn. Uh, that's the very sad thing. I think there's going to be a lot of very, very traumatized people that, that has hit them very, very hard. Jane, I think many of us, when we heard the news, perhaps on the radio earlier today, were uh, completely flabbergasted by it and, and just couldn't un comprehend it. I mean, it, was, it almost sounded too far-fetched. Um, I was wondering what it's felt like for you being in Manhattan. Well, unfortunately, I think we've lost the line with uh, Jane Stanley in Manhattan. Now, here we're going to show you a videotape of the collapse itself. Describe that. Now we go to videotape the collapse of this building. Amazing, incredible picture word. Too far fetched. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. See what you see and not what you're supposed to see. A Counterpunch article examines unresolved questions over whether Israeli agents were tracking the 9-11 hijackers before September 11th. ABC's 2020, The Forward, and Salon.com have all covered the story. But where's the follow-up? Democracy Now! Amy Goodman speaks with article's author Christopher Ketchum, Counterpunch editor Alexander Cockburn, and Mark Perlman, the forward reporter who did one of the first reports on the story in 2002. Uh, the, the best evidence that we have uh, for this is, in fact, the story of these five moving men. Now, three of these guys were um, seen on the morning of September 11th, just after the first plane hit the North Tower, uh, quote-unquote, celebrating on the New Jersey waterfront. Now, that's, that's the, I put the quotes around that because it comes from the FBI Bolo, or be on lookout, an alert that was put out regarding these men uh, that day. Um, the celebration apparently consisted of uh, high-fiving, according to one FBI official, of uh, holding up cigarette lighters as if they're at a rock concert. So remember, the plane has just, just hit the tower, exploded in the tower, and these, these three men are behaving rather oddly. Um, Later in the day, they were picked up. Two other men had apparently joined them in a van. They were, um, they were, the case was immediately handed over to FBI counterintelligence. Uh, the men were held for 71 days. Um, they were repeatedly interrogated. They were, uh, well, they, they failed, repeatedly failed lie detector tests. And, um, and then after those 71 days was up, they were sent home, apparently under pressure, or because of pressure brought by the Israeli government and by um, certain players in the U.S. government, uh, and the story sort of disappeared from there. I mean, 2020 Just covered thing. this. Chris Ketchum, you say, um, you quote the officer who arrested them, and, uh, named DiCarlo. You say, according to DiCarlo's report, this officer was told without question by the driver of the, move van, of the moving van, Sivan Kurzberg, we are Israeli. We are not your problem. Your problems are our problems. The Palestinians are the problem. Right. Well, what's interesting there is that you I mean you recall uh, after the first plane hit, um, no one really thought that this was a terrorist attack. I mean, most people thought, and I was there, you know, on the Brooklyn waterfront watching this whole thing. I, everyone thought it was an accident. Uh, these guys, when they were interrogated by FBI, told them that. Uh, essentially said that they immediately knew it was a terrorist attack. And uh, they actually told FBI that the reason they were celebrating uh, was because uh, the, uh, the attacks would be beneficial to Israel, that it was, a quote, a good thing for Israel. That's according to the FBI spokesman who spoke on the record about this. And, um, and that it would bring uh, sympathy for the Israel, Israel's 
political uh, agenda in the Middle East. Newly obtained video that was reluctantly released by NIST after a lawsuit by the International Center for 9-11 Studies shows two firefighters on 9-11 discussing how secondary explosions occurred immediately before the collapse of the Twin Towers, providing damning new evidence that explosive devices were used to bring down the buildings. Firemen discuss how bombs were going off in the lobby of WTC-1 as they were staging to move up the building. They explain how the building had already been hit by the plane and fires were already burning. After two explosions in the lobby, a third went off and the whole lobby collapsed. For those who deny the idea that explosives were placed inside the building prior to the event now need to watch as another evidence is provided to prove that this was pre-planned from the inside out, not just a plane hijacking. What happened? It was an explosion. It was in the lobby and fucking the, the third explosion, the whole lobby collapsed on us. What was it like? What was it like? Horrible. It's like Horrible. hell. You don't the want to know. The whole building just collapsed on us inside the lobby. Was that a secondary explosion? Yes, it was. That was so the planet probably? Yeah, definitely a secondary explosion. Because we was inside waiting to go upstairs. And on the way upstairs, the whole fucking plane blew. And we just, we just collapsed on everybody inside the lobby. Similar to the first tower coming down, secondary? I don't know about the first one, but I know the second one, was, it was terrible. Then there was a third one, too, after that one. Third yeah. explosion after that? Yes, sir. And you were in everybody the was inside the building, waiting to go upstairs. And they, they, just, they just let loose. Everything just let loose inside the building. So what, what you tell me is that there was a plane or whatever hit the building, and then a the secondary explosion. It was like three explosions after that. We came in after the after the fire. We came when the fire was going on already. We was in the staging area inside the building, okay. waiting to go upstairs. Oh, right. And they oh, exploded. Oh, the, right. the whole lobby collapsed on the lobby inside. And it was just mayhem after that? No, just man, everybody tried to make their way out. Just trying to help all the brothers get out. A lot of people, lot of people and trapped and inside. I was sitting in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, across from Brooklyn. We watched the first explosion. Yeah. As we were watching the building, so a black, very large airplane fly right into the second building. It came out of the south, right, right in front of our eyes. Just as I know, these three or four. It, it was so surreal, like a movie set. Second, second, and third explosions also, right? We were in the building for the third one. It collapsed. On this drive here for the other one. These people don't understand. There may be more. Any one of these fucking buildings could blow up. This ain't done yet. This is this is on top of this. This could be no worse than this. Could be nothing. Nothing no more than worse than this. You're in the building trying to help people, and it's exploding on the inside the building. So I don't think you get any worse than this. I'm sure some might wonder what's the big deal, right? So what? There were explosions. That's the weird thing. If they wanted to lie about the 911 attack, they could have just said that there were some assailants of the attack who maybe just also put in the explosions beforehand, right? But for some strange reason, the media and the government were fully adamant in denying completely that any explosions took place. In fact, they were so against the idea that they even took down clips like this and were fully against it. Going to extreme lengths to make sure these type of videos weren't released to the public, because it made it look like this was certainly an inside job, since it didn't match the story they were going with to the public. Now next we'll need to address the issue of the collapse of the building. This was one of the main points on which many structural engineers just could not accept that the building came down on its own, without it being brought down, or in construction the verb to bring down a building in a controlled explosion is also known as pull it. Here's a clip of a few buildings being brought down by demolition experts who used almost a ton of explosives to implode the 116-meter AFE tower in Frankfurt, Germany. Explosives set. All floors clear. Rounds clear. Three, two, one, fire. A simple common sense look at floors pancaking and falling on top of one another clearly proves the sheer fairy tale nature of the official 911 conspiracy theory as told here by Nova. A respected science show, Nova, faced the challenge of convincing the public that the impossible was actually the only possible explanation. 
to do this, it was first necessary to describe the steel supports in the towers as thinner and weaker than they actually were. But the tall vertical columns of the inner core and the outer walls were like freestanding stilts until Robertson tied them together with floor trusses. The next step was to create a pancake collapse simulation. Since this is impossible using the laws of science, it was first necessary to remove the outer wall supports that carry 40% of the tower's weight. Since office fires would have negligible effect on the steel structure, it was also necessary to remove all floor connections with the internal support structure. Finally, the simulation would run. But will 110 floors really collapse like pancakes in 10 seconds? Let's time it to find out. The first floor to collapse took one and a half seconds to fall 12 feet. The second floor was faster at one second for a total of two and a half seconds. As the gravity collapse starts to speed up, Ignoring the hundreds of internal and external welded connections supporting each floor, we see 10 floors have collapsed after 6 seconds. This clearly indicates that the official pancake collapse theory cannot begin to explain how the buildings fell in just 10 seconds and is so unreasonable that it should be immediately rejected out of common sense. Yet it has become the conventional wisdom of the day and we must all pause and ask ourselves how this could have come about. This is the completion of part one and two. I might add even further evidences to these in the near future which could turn into a part three. Either way, I want to thank everyone for the support on part one of this multi-part series. These types of videos require deep digging around on the internet since these types of clips are always blocked or taken down, so any support on this channel is appreciated. Do support my Patreon as well. The link to it is in the description. The truth needs to be heard. I'll do my best to keep bringing it to as many as I can. Thanks for watching.